Welcome everyone again to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactics Series, weekly discussions of practice and science by experts in behavioral health and the law, hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, along with the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. I'm Anthony Perillo, the Forensic Psychology Training Director in the Division of Forensic Behavioral Sciences in the University of New Mexico's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. For our talk today, if you have any questions for our presenter, make sure you enter them in the Q&A box anytime you feel comfortable. Know that we do hold the questions till the end. We try to get to as many as we can. Um, just forgive us if we don't get to yours. If you are pursuing uh, medical education credits, there will be a sign-in in the chat box shortly. And if you are pursuing APA continuing education credits, a link in the chat box will be posted in the latter half of the web. Webinar. Make sure you check that link before you leave the webinar and make sure after you complete the survey, you save your certificate because we don't have access to those after the fact. A recording and the PowerPoint slides for this presentation will be available sometime later this week. And as a heads up for next week's talk in the series, we have Dr. Lucy Guanera, who will be joining us to discuss trauma and propensity for false confession. But back to this week, uh, I'm very excited to introduce you to today's speaker who will be discussing an important issue in forensic practice of identifying and avoiding junk science and forensic assessment. This is Dr. Tess Neal. Dr. Tess Neal is an associate professor of psychology and as of this fall serves as a dean's professor at Iowa State University. She was previously tenured at Arizona State University, where she was the founding director of the Future of Forensic Science Initiative. Dr. Neal is a scientist a licensed psychologist trained to assess, diagnose, and treat mental and behavioral disorders, and a forensic psychologist trained to bring psychology into legal contexts. She studies the nature and limits of expertise, and her basic work focuses on understanding and improving human judgment, especially among trained experts, and her more applied work focuses on improving forensic and legal experts' judgments in particular. Her work's been funded by several grant agencies, multiple grants by the National Science Foundation, um, over four dozen scientific papers, and as of January 1, she will be the new Editor-in-Chief of Psychology, Public Policy, and Law. She's a Fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and the American Psychological Association, and recently completed a Fulbright Scholarship in Australia. I'll also add, as, as a personal note, she's one of those rare people who's also won national accolades for her scholarship and her teaching and her mentorship. Um, I think that demonstrates that she makes great contributions to the field as a scientist, as an educator, and uh, even more importantly, as a human being. Um, so, Dr. Neil Tess, uh, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, um, we're very thankful and excited for you joining us on the series and look forward to you sharing your expertise with us. I'll go ahead and throw it over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Perillo, for that really kind introduction. And also, it's really nice that you're here with the University of New Mexico group now. Um, this is an awesome program. And I'm happy to be part of it and happy that you're, you're with that crew now. Uh, so today I'm going to talk with you about identifying and avoiding junk science in forensic psychological assessments. This kind of line of work I've been doing for a number of years now, uh, and I have presented it at a couple of conferences. Uh, so some of you may be uh, familiar with some of it, but it's kind of pulling together multiple pieces into this one presentation today. So these we talked a little bit about this, but there's you can get the CEs at the end. Disclosure, no financial arrangement. Disclaimer, they're my views, not necessarily UNM's views. The learning objectives, hopefully you were able to see these before, um, but we're going to talk about the criteria the law uses to identify junk science by expert witnesses. We'll also talk about how that law is changing, actually how it changed three days ago. Um, we will... Um, I. We'll work on estimating the average scientific validity of assessment tools used by psychologists as evidence in court. Uh, you'll hopefully, by the end of this, you'll be able to explain how calibrated courts are to the scientific validity of psychological assessment tools that we might offer as experts. And then also, um, I will share with you some free, high quality resources for improving forensic psychological assessment practice and moving us away from where the junk science does live in our discipline, helping move us away from, from some of that. So you are all probably uh, pretty familiar with this background, but sometimes I give this talk or pieces of this talk to other audiences. So I figured because this is the sort of more interesting public facing part of the talk, I was gonna keep it in here. Um, but perhaps you have seen um, a show, there was a Netflix docu-series a few years ago called Making a Murderer. And there was a character in that show named Brendan Dassey, who's pictured here. 
he has something in common with this woman named Andrea Yates, who was uh, who, who murdered her children in a bathtub. Uh, they both have something in common with Mike Tyson, a professional heavyweight. Um, he's retired now, but a professional heavyweight boxer. They all have something in common with Jeffrey Dahmer, who was a um, serial killer and a, a person who was convicted of cannibalism. They all have something in common with Hollywood celebrities, uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. They all have something in common with Canadian singer songwriter, Justin Bieber, who all have something in common with Daryl Atkins, who is a man who was facing uh, capital punishment in Virginia. What they all have in common was that at the, at a, a central piece of their cases involved some kind of psychological question at the core of the case. And they were all very different kinds of cases, very different questions in different systems of justice, but they all had, their, their, what they had in common was a psychological question at the center of the case. And the field that helps the court solve or understand those questions of psychology is called forensic psychology, which you all know, um, and how, in terms of just kind of how common or how big the field is. About 7% of licensed psychologists uh, work in some capacity in forensic psychology. So it's a, a fairly sizable chunk of the discipline of psychology. You also all know this, but I'm covering it anyway, that the role of psychological tests in law is quite broad. So, um, and the weight that judges and courts assign to psychological testing evidence or opinion evidence based on psychological tests can be significant. So among the types of cases, these were just cases that we found when we did one of the projects I'll present to you, but these were just some of the citations of cases in like a three-year period. There were clear parental fitness for custody questions, termination of parental rights, civil torts, social security, and disability proceedings, which are actually very common, competence and insanity proceedings, pretrial and sentencing risk assessments, two different um, types of risk assessments, and eligibility for capital punishment among lots of other types of referral questions. And as you likely know, when a, when a psychologist is asked to do a mental health evaluation, uh, we might rely on psychological tests. Uh, and the point that I wanted to make with this piece is that, and I did, I did not fully understand this until I was through with graduate school, actually through with postdoc, I was on the other side of training and was thinking quite hard about how the court, actually I'll tell you where this kind of, where the, where the problem piece came from. Um, but I, the point I wanna make here is that um, just because a test is sold or marketed or in a glossy magazine does not necessarily make it a scientifically valid test. I think many of us make that inference because it seems, I always sort of thought that if a publisher is going to be selling a product that there's going to be a strong evidence base behind it. Many times that is the case, but it is not necessarily the case. Um, and so we all have homework to do in some, in some capacity to make sure that we all know this, but I'm saying it anyway explicitly because we also know that we don't all do this. We have data about that. Um, and also just one other point about this is that psychological assessments are a big business industry. Some of the companies that publish uh, the assessments that we might use are um, they're for-profit companies and they make good money um, on some of the tests that we use. So there's a market incentive that not always, it doesn't always work in the same direction that scientific incentive might work. And so that incompatibility, it's not necessarily incompatibility, but they're not always necessarily incentivized to work in the same direction. So if we step back a second and think about the stakes of expert evidence, of what happens when we bring psychological evidence into court, um, you would think that given the high stakes that, that the court would be doing a really nice job and we would be doing a really nice job of making sure that the validity of what we're offering is really carefully thought through. And beyond just what we are supposed to do as psychologists bringing this kind of evidence to court, the court also, we're supposed to do a good job of bringing in good evidence. And then the courts also, not just for psychologists, but for all types of experts, the courts have an obligation to make sure that um, before an expert is qualified to offer an expert opinion, that their evidence, the methods and the um, 
information that they're trying to, to proffer as evidence, that it is valid and reliable. We um, have Merrill Dow v, no, sorry, Dower v Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, a 1993 case that was a very big case and became a trilogy of cases that probably most of you were well aware of. Um, that that series of cases changed what had been, we'll talk more about what the particular rules are, um, but it, it, it strengthened the rules and, and in terms of what they used to be uh, before that, it became sort of stronger. So many people expected that the evidence that we were bringing to court would be challenged more frequently uh, and that it would be, that more attention would be paid to what we were trying to bring to court. Um, that case, that, that was case law, the Dar Daubert trilogy was case law, it was later codified into the federal rules of evidence, and most states have, um, have also codified those similar rules into the state rules of evidence. Now that has recently changed, we'll talk about that as well, but it's changed in a very minor way um, that probably will not have much impact on your practice, but we'll, we'll talk about that. One other point about this is that Judges are charged with doing this. Judges have to um, screen evidence. They have to screen, uh, or they're supposed to screen what evidence, what experts are trying to offer into evidence, and then and not admit it, not let it in, not let the jury hear it, um, or let it in to a bench trial if it's unreliable or ir or irrelevant. Uh, but we know that they're not, judges are not great at this for a variety of reasons. It's a challenging task. Judges are not well trained to do this task. Despite good training and being really smart and good at their job, this particular task is very hard to do. Um, and it's perhaps unsurprisingly based on those challenges. Um, there's evidence that um, judges are not doing a great job at, at this task. Um, so the, what this process looks like is that judges have the responsibility to gatekeep, but they only do so typically when the attorneys first challenge the evidence. So if the attorney does not raise an admissibility challenge, then it's much less likely, almost never does a judge raise a sort of sui sponte um, admissibility issue. It, that can happen, but it almost never happens because of the ad adversarial system that our, that our American justice system operates under. Um, so the system sort of relies on attorneys to challenge the evidence to begin with if there's going to be any kind of gatekeeping opportunity for the judge. Now, whether attorneys challenge evidence when they should be challenging evidence is a different question. We also know from clear evidence about that that they do not always challenge when they should be challenging, and they sometimes challenge when there's not good reason to challenge. So there's improvements to be made uh, there as well. Um, once the attorneys challenge the evidence, then judges have the opportunity to do an invisibility hearing and they can grant um, or deny the motion to ex exclude the evidence. So what are the criteria that judges look for if this, if an attorney does raise a challenge and if the court does do an invisibility hearing? These are the criteria that were outlined in the Daubert v. Merrill Dow case that uh, were later codified. And um, I'll get there in a second. So basically it boils down to, first there's this rule that the evidence has to be relevant. That's, that comes sort of before this test even, even occurs. So first there's this question of whether the evidence is relevant to the case. If the, if the judge decides, yes, it's relevant, then the judge is supposed to focus on the method used by the expert. So it's not necessarily on the outcome, it's not on the direction of the opinion, it's not on what the expert has to say in conclusion, it's how did they get to the conclusion? the method that they used to reach their conclusion. Was that method subjected to any kind of testing? Has there been science done on the method? Is that method generally accepted by other experts in that expert's field? Has that method been peer reviewed by experts in the same field? And what is the error rate of the method? Um, the Fry v. US case 1923 that's cited here at the bottom, that is the old evidence rule that used to be part of they used to be the majority um, rule of how, admiss how how evidence was decided, how the admissibility evidence of evidence was determined. And that was based on that second piece, the general acceptance. So it used to just be, um, is the evidence, is the method that an expert is trying to use generally accepted in its own field? If the answer to that question was yes, 
then it was admissible. These other pieces came in 1993 because uh, between uh, 1923 and 1993, in that 70 year period, um, the courts came to realize that that general acceptance rule wasn't good enough on its own. So there needed to be, the junk science was getting in. So they tried to strengthen the rules to ensure that less junk science or ideally no junk science would, would get in. Um, now we know that this version is also not working in the way that it ideally would work or could work. So they're tinkering it with it, with it again, but we'll get there. So now I'm gonna show you some results from a big project that we published a few years ago, where we were really kind of digging in on those issues in forensic psychology. So we wanted to know on average, how scientifically valid are psychological assessment tools used by psychologists as evidence in court? And then separately, are courts calibrated to that? If there's variation, if some, if some of what we're bringing in is junky, are the courts screening it out? So it's, it's a two-part project. Uh, part one, project one answers the first question and project two answers the second question. As we go from this point forward on some slides, I'll have the um, QR code. That's a link. So if you have a cell phone or something, um, you can take a, you can open your camera and it should pull up the, the web address for these, for these papers. I also want to note that I think all the projects that I'm talking with you about today are published open access, meaning that everything should be freely available. You should not hit a paywall for anything. Um, we've either paid the fees up front or negotiated with the publisher to make sure everything that we're talking about today um, is available to you or attorneys or judges um, in the interest of trying to improve the quality of evidence in courts. So just as a sort of preview, the gist of the findings from this big project is that there's clear variation in quality. So that the answer to the question, are we as psychologists just bringing good evidence into court or is some of what we bring junky? The answer is that there's variation. A lot of what we bring is excellent, but some of what we bring is junky. We'll get into the details. Um, and then the answer to question two is that courts are not calibrated to that. They're letting in, we will see as we go, but they're, they're basically not challenging us. And we are more likely to be challenged when the tool is strong um, than when it's junky. And we'll, we almost are unlikely to face a challenge if it's a particularly junky tool. So the name of the paper, it was published in 2019, um, is called Psychological Assessments in Legal Contexts. Are courts keeping junk science out of the courtroom? This is a, um, it's a, it's a journal that operates with a particular, usually articles are published here by, there's a board that operates this journal um, and the board sort of decides what are the topics that they think um, are important for the public it's psychological science in the public interest. So the articles are supposed to be in the interest of the public um, and based on psychological science. And so the board will often sort of generate ideas about what they think is most topical or timely going on in the world. And then they will convene um, a, a panel of experts who can write on that topic together. There's a secondary model for how papers get published in this particular journal. It's rare, I guess. Um, but you can pitch. So if you're if you're a person with an idea, you can pitch to the board. And if the board likes your idea, you can then they can they might ask you to come up with a team of authors. Um, there's criteria for who how those authors have to be pulled together. But if they like all that, then they might commission the project. And that's the process that happened with this particular article. So I pitched it, um, and then I was told I was junior and <laughs> didn't have a lot of name credibility and had to pull together a team. Um, that had good name credibility to help build out um, build out pieces of the article. And each particular author had to have a different, a distinct um, area of expertise that could all together, we could contribute um, broadly to the questions that we were we were studying. So that's what happened here. We have law professors, we have psychologists, we have forensic psychologists, and we have uh, psychometric experts. Um, also, so we, we, after this, the editor of this particular journal, um, she put together a um, proposal to the, to the AAAS, the American Academy of Science, I'm, I'm getting that wrong, but AAAS, 
um, they have an annual conference. It's a multidisciplinary science conference. Um, and they have a sort of, she said, we want to focus in this session at the conference. We want to have a, um, not a seminar, whatever it's called when you have a bunch of people in one session. Cannot think of the word. Anyway, so there were several of us who had published um, that year in this journal. I think there were four articles published in the journal that year. So we together presented in one session at AAAS at the conference. And then that session was picked by, um, there was a process for the press release people at Science. So they picked this particular session because there was high public interest in some of what we were presenting in that session. So they picked this session and everybody who was presenting in that session had a lot of press coverage. So that's um, that happened in this case as well. So this particular project, well, it was covered in a lot of outlets. So you may have seen it and that's how that came to be. Um, and if you've worked with science journalists, you may know that sometimes they sort of pick the angle that they think is gonna be most of most interest. And it may not be the angle that you wanted to pick as the scientist. Um, so if you saw this and read this and you were um, questioning why this was the angle that was um, targeted, there's lots of reasons why. Um, but the, the main sort of finding that was highlighted by the press was that courtroom psychology tests may be unreliable. And that is part of what we found, but it's not the whole truth of what we found. Okay, so part one, uh, this was, how we answered the question about whether we were bringing just good science into court or if there was um, some junkier stuff in what we were offering. So to begin that process, we needed to know what tools are used in forensic settings. And I'm gonna go back in time. So this, the, the beginning of that 2009 paper was really a 2014 project that I did when I was a postdoc at UMass Med School. Um, I was really curious at the time when I was a postdoc about about whether psychologists were, how psychologists were using um, tools to structure their judgment, whether most of us were, were using structured assessment tools to reduce bias and improve the quality of our assessment process, or um, how many of us were still kind of using clinical judgment and um, not using structured processes in our approach. So that's what motivated this particular, that the project that I did on postdoc. Um, and we had a, a large survey. Uh, it was an interdisciplinary and international sample of clinicians. It was mostly psychologists, um, but there were some psychiatrists in the sample. We had 434 clinicians who responded to this eight question um, survey. And each one responded on their two most recent forensic evaluations. So we asked questions like, I don't have it in here, but the questions were, go into your final, into your file cabinet or into your electronic file system and find your two most recent forensic evaluations. And then for each one of those, tell us, answer a series of eight questions. What was the referral question? Um, by whom were you hired? I think we asked. Did you use any structured assessment tools was key to what ended up happening with this project. Um, how long was the report? Things like that. But the just in terms of the, the tools themselves, um, the answer, the, the kind of key question that I was seeking was how many of us use tools to begin with versus use our clinical judgment. And that answer was that across the 868 reports, 74% were using some kind of structured assessment tool and about 26% were not. And then we can dig down further into that data. So of those uh, people who did report using structured tools, what was the referral question? Um, and then how many tools on average did you use? Oh, and then we also asked what, what tools, tests, interviews, whatever, if you did use them, what did you use? And that was an open-ended question. And then that was a ton of work to then figure out what to do with that data, but we dug in. So here we see um, sort of the, just the distribution for um, oh, I said earlier that all the papers would be not hitting a paywall. This one is not open access. So if you hit a paywall and you want this project, I'm happy to send it to you. Just email me. Um, okay, so the, the important point from this slide is that across that circled bit, so average across all referrals, the total number of different tools used was 286. So remember, this is a sample of 868 reports. 
of those 868 reports, psychologists reported using 286 distinct psychological assessment tools. That is a massive variety of different things that we are using and bringing into court. So perhaps it's not so surprising that the court is not keeping up with us so well. It's a different problem. So coming back to this, this 286 number, with regard to what was in that 286, we, we were overwhelmed. I hadn't heard of most of the tools that people reported using in real forensic evaluations, and neither had Tom Grisso, the um, very esteemed forensic psychologist and um, mentor of, of the postdoc program who helped with this project. He also was unfamiliar with most of those tools. So we started doing just a little sort of digging about them and we were surprised, worried, um, and not sure what to do with that data. So what we did is, I just went back a slide. In 2014, we, we summarized and published what did make sense, what was um, in this particular paper we report on, what are the most commonly used tools for each referral question, um, and so there's really useful, interesting, descriptive data in this paper, but much of that that was in the 286 just was not unpacked for that 2014 paper. But I didn't forget about I didn't forget about it, and I was always sort of wondering why was there so much in there that neither one of us had ever heard of? Like, how could the field be so diverse? How could we, we be using so much different stuff? So fast forward several years, now we're starting to go back into that 2019 paper. So to answer the beginning part of the question for that project, like what are we using? We did, we, we did a literature review to figure out what are psychologists using as tools in forensic cases. So we used our data, 286 um, tools that we knew from our, our paper, but also there were 22 other relevant practitioner surveys in the field that had data about what tools psychologists either use or what they thought were appropriate or what they thought were inappropriate. So we used um, all of these different methods to help us figure out all of these different uh, articles to help us figure out the, all the different distinct tools that psychologists are using in forensic cases. And shout out to Christopher King who helped pull all this together because he really did the legwork on this part of, of things. So thank you, Chris. Um, so we used all that together. We had 286 from our initial project, adding all the tools from those other papers. I think we had like 340, we'll see in a second, but we had something like close to 350 tools. So then we used that chunk of tools that we know are used in some way um, in forensic cases. And then we had a, the project was trying to diagnose the quality of those tools. So how can we map on those Daubert type criteria? Has it been tested? What's the error rate? Um, is it generally accepted? And whatever the fourth one was. Um, so we were looking for evidence to code those questions for each one of those psychological assessment tools. So we used manuals for the tools. We used articles in the peer reviewed literature. We looked to the standards for what makes good tools and we used comprehensive review sources, which I'll, I'll show you. This was the, the standards for educational and psychological testing. So we used these as kind of guide, a guidebook for how to make sense of whether with the metrics and with the process by which a tool was developed, um, like are those good psychometrics and so forth. So we used um, this tool. And then we also used comprehensive review sources. So the compendium of neuropsychological tests, Strauss et al. compendium, we used that quite a lot for anything that had any neuro related um, piece, there's a good summary of neuropsychological tests in here, kind of what's the body of evidence for these for these tests um, and with commentary. So it's their opinion about some of it, but it's quite useful information. Tom Grisso had an evaluating competency book. Um, so that particular book was useful for background information about the scientific validity of competence, um, specifically those kinds of tools. And then we also use the Mental Measurements Yearbook, which you may or may not be familiar with. Mental measure measurements, your book is not a great primary source for a practicing clinician to use to decide whether or not to use a tool. Like we should be doing a deeper dive. We should be reading manuals. We should be looking at the literature. Um, but the mental measurements, your book is great for judges and attorneys and maybe us if we're kind of just doing a quick um, review of what, you know, what does a tool look like? What's, what's the 
summary of information about its psychometrics, there's good information there. Um, so the Mental Measurement Yearbook has provided information about the technical quality of psychological tests for more than 90 years. Um, it's published by the Burroughs Center for Testing. Um, and it's, it's whole, it's a nonprofit, it's whole identity and purpose is to protect test users um, and to hold publishers accountable for their claims. So kind of nicely at this solving this problem um, that we were identifying earlier on that sometimes publishers are for-profit companies, many of them are, that the incentive is to make money. And so, you know, a, a, a source like this is to hold publishers accountable for their claims um, and, and look at the evidence for whether a tool does what it says it can do and what are the metrics for the tool? Um, also, just as a note, um, with the Mental Measurements Yearbook, the director of the Borough Center for Testing, who has been involved in several of these um, yearbooks over the years, is Kurt Geisinger, who's one of the authors of the paper. So he, we, we pulled him in and included him uh, because of his psychometric background and this broad variety of exposure to mental um, psychological tests that he's had over time. Um, also, the last thing I wanted to say is that there are these volumes that they publish. The mental measurements of your books are literally <clears throat> books that are reference manuals. You can see them in libraries and so forth. But what's more useful is their website. So if you go to the website, you can search psych tests. It does something similar, but I'm very familiar with the mental measurements of your book because we used it for this project. Um, but you can also um, you can review a la carte, so you don't have to buy or go to the library to see the whole thing. If you just want to know about, I don't know, the PAI, or you just want to know about the Rorschach, you can go and um, purchase, I think it's $15 to get the reviews um, and the summaries for any given test, which is useful, again, if you're an attorney or a judge um, and you want some background on the tools that a psychologist might have used. Um, there's one other thing I was going to say about this, but I have forgotten what it was. Okay, so that's how we sort of diagnose part of the question. The second um, question was, are, tools, are these tools, the sample of 350 or whatever it was, how do we know if it was generally accepted in the field? So to answer this question, to code that question for each one of these tools, we searched nine surveys of mental health professionals with relevance to general acceptance, all of which had been published within the previous 15 years. Um, and then we searched each article for content related Oh, it was 364. That was the number of tools. We had an automatic PDF cross-reference program um, do this first, and then whatever, everything that identified, we then followed up with human coders actually looked, um, and much of that was not good, but it did identify, it screened, it over-screened in, but everything it screened in wasn't um, necessarily good content. So we had the human, human coders kind of clean that up. So these were um, the nine articles, which is cited in our article, but there was pretty um, well-known slick articles, uh, Robert Archer, um, Stephen Lally, uh, McLaughlin and Cam, lots of really great papers. Uh, so, okay, so how did we code all this? We had a coding scheme um, that our whole author team developed. Then we uh, developed and implemented a training scheme for how we were going to code all that data. We had 30 coders for this project. It was a massive undertaking. We met on three full day, we called them codeathons, to generate the results. And <clears throat> we had a little bit of funding for this. So we, we bought meals, we had breakfast, we had coffee, we had lunch. I think, I don't remember if we had dinners, but we definitely had um, snacks and goodies and tried to make it as pleasant as possible while doing a ton of work. And each one of these variables was coded at three levels. So we, and, and, and independently by four different coders. So for each variable, um, we assigned four individual coders. Then once all that was coded, then um, we randomly assigned um, a duo, two of the four people who coded to work together to resolve discrepancies. And then at that point, we just had two versions for each variable. And if there were discrepancies at that level, then we had the duos get together to resolve any further discrepancies. <clears throat> and the reliabilities from this process are reported in the paper. These were video, uh, pictures that are really grainy, but this was from the, the codathons, which were fun, even if also a lot of work. <laughs> Results. Was it tested? This is where we look the best as psychologists. We have a strong um, 
sort of history of psychological testing and um, testing our the performance of our psychological tests. So we look good here. So of those 364 tools, um, we found evidence that 90% of what psychologists were bringing into court uh, had been subjected to some kind of testing. Is the method generally accepted in its field? So we found no evidence about this question of, of general acceptance for 51% of the 364 tools. So now, if you imagine that you're a judge and you're in charge of screening out whether, you know, or screening whether a psychologist should be allowed to testify on the basis of, you know, a, a, an opinion that's based on a set of psychological assessment tools. Um, and if many of those tools, there's no information in, in available about their general acceptance, it's really hard to make it to make a screening decision about that. And then we did find evidence for the, the other 49% um, that a good chunk of them are generally accepted, but then we found a, a chunk of them, it was either unclear or conflicting. Some of the sources would say there is good general acceptance and some would say there's not. And for 8%, we found clear evidence that they are not generally accepted in the field. And yet we know that they're that, that psychologists are bringing them into court. Um, so this is now just looking at taking out the 51% um, of what we did have information for, 67% were generally accepted, 17% had unclear or conflicting evidence, and 17% um, were not generally accepted. So we would hope that this, the courts are screening out the 17% not generally accepted. That might be something we would look for in study two. Okay, and then this, the last two criteria, um, has it been peer reviewed and what is its error rate? We basically kind of looked at looked at both of those in one way. So we we didn't we coded for overall summary evaluation of quality, where it was I don't even remember what the anchors were, but we had four levels here, and it was like maybe we'll it was generally favorable, generally unfavorable, and mixed or no reviews. So first of all, we and, and we, this is based on psychometric evidence. It's based on performance and, and so forth, um, and a summary across the entire literature, the manual, what's in the peer-reviewed literature, kind of just summarizing that all together. So first of all, we found no information for 37% of those tools. And then we found um, for the rest of the tools that about 25% had clearly favorable or generally favorable quality, psychometric, scientific um, properties. 23% uh, were mixed. There were some things were good, some things, some things were performing well, other things were more questionable. And then 15% were generally unfavorable, not good psychometrics, not on scientifically strong footing. And again, we know that these are being used. So again, now like taking out that 37% where we don't have any information, just looking at uh, what we do have information for, about 40% generally favorable, 37% mixed, and 23% generally unfavorable. All right, so what's the relationship between that, those, that overall evaluation of psychometric scientific quality and general acceptance? We would hope that those have a, a high relationship. They do have a relationship. So the relationship is st statistically significant and it's in the direction that we would hope that, um, that the, the better the tool is, the more it's generally accepted in the field, but the effect is weaker. The effect size is weaker than we might hope. And there, there's still evidence that even though there's um, generally unfavorable uh, overall kind of psychometric quality, there's still a chunk of things that are generally accepted, um, right? So that is not great for the field. So ideally we could, we could get better at not doing that. All right, so now answering part two, are the courts calibrated? Are they scrutinizing us? Are they screening out the, the, the worst of what we have to offer? To do this, uh, we, instead of looking at all 364 tools, we pulled 30 of them as exemplars. Um, and we sort of, we tried to map them out across all these dimensions. So we wanted some that were generally favorable, that had generally favorable reviews, like good, good psychometric quality, um, good scientific underpinnings, and that are generally accepted. So those are the things that hopefully most psychologists are using and that um, the courts are letting in if it's, if it's used appropriately in a case. We also wanted to look for um, tools that have generally unfavorable reviews and that are not generally accepted. So these are the things that 
there's agreement, there's clear information about how these should not be admissible. The judges, if they're doing a good job, they should be screening these things out. And then things that are more difficult, right? Mixed reviews, generally acceptance debated, um, like kind of just curious how the court is treating these and all these other um, intersections of, of these categories. So our method for this part of the project, we again, sort of conceptually developed the idea for how we were gonna do this. And then we enlisted student help. Uh, these were law students who helped with this search. They searched Westlaw for all judicial opinions and orders from all states and federal courts in a three-year period from 2016 to 2018. And then they screened in all cases that involved our 30 exemplar tools. So at that stage, we had 876 cases. So, and this is only what's screened in are only cases that really are our tools. And so for example, there were a few cases where Rorschach was mentioned in, so Westlaw found it, but it was like somebody's last name or something. It wasn't in reference to the tool. So of that 876 cases in the three-year period, we know that every single one of those cases really was, um, was a judicial opinion that was mentioning um, one of our tools in an admissibility type of context. So instead of reading all 876 cases, um, we basically decided that we would read up to 30 cases for every one of the 30 tools. So there were three tools uh, that had more than 30 cases. So for instance, Rorschach, I think had like 400 cases or something. It was a huge number of cases where the Rorschach was involved and we weren't gonna read 400 Rorschach. We didn't need to read 400 Rorschach cases to get the gist of what was going on. So we randomly subsampled um, 30 cases from, from all three of those tools that generated more than 30, that had more than 30 cases uh, involving them. So in sum, that was 372 legal cases. So some of them only had like one or two cases um, some of them had 30, most of them were somewhere in between one and 30. Those cases were read and analyzed by the law professors on the authorship team, and they were reading and coding for whether the tool's admissibility had been challenged, and if so, on what grounds and with what results. So um, this was just a picture of that process. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this is Chris Lebogan who was a great co-author on this and did a lot of really high quality work on this project. And he's looking very happy to be there. Yeah, I think he actually did enjoy the project, but he looks like he's working hard. All right, so our results from part two are courts scrutinizing psychological assessment evidence. This is just the most basic broad um, summary of the results. So the frequency of challenges to psychological assessment evidence involving those 372 cases where we know there was some mention of one or more of the 30 tools we were, we were looking for. Uh, overall, we found that 94.9% .9 were unchallenged. There was no challenge to the evidence. And that 5.1%, there was some type of challenge uh, to the admissibility of the evidence. And these were the the, the basis for the challenges, like what, what was being challenged. There was fit, uh, whether it was appropriate to the case. There was validity. So this is what we were most interested in. Are they being challenged on the sort of scientific underpinnings? Um, and there were, there were more validity challenges than any other type of challenges. Uh, there were unhelpfulness challenges and then qualification. There was one qualification challenge. So there was a challenge that the person who had done it was not qualified to administer the test. Um, and then this also maps out whether it failed and whether it succeeded. So failed means that it wasn't, it was allowed in and succeeded means the challenge succeeded. So it was not allowed in, it was screened out. So 32% succeeded in the sense that it was not allowed to be admitted into court, which is a fairly, they're hardly, uh, hardly challenged to begin with. And then if they are challenged, those challenges are unlikely to succeed. And only about a third of the cases does the challenge su succeed? Um, and then with regard to this, I, I sort of teased a little bit earlier that the rules have changed, the admissibility rules have changed, and this is part of the reason why those have changed. And it, we, we found this information in our data um, for most of those failed challenges where the attorney did raise some kind of admissibility challenge and the judge said, no, it's gonna be admitted anyway. 
the judge, the rationale that the judge provided for why they weren't going to screen out um, the evidence, even if many cases the judge said, yeah, there are problems here, but these problems should go to weight rather than admissibility, which means the judge is saying, I'm not screening. I want the jury to have to grapple with the problem and recognize the uh, problems in this expert evidence and then use that to um, tamper their how credible or how persuaded they are by this expert rather than the judge um, serving as a gatekeeper the judge is saying i'm going to let in lesser quality stuff and have the jury weight it appropriately this turns out to be a problem that judges are doing it and also juries are not great at this like the whole reason we have the screening process is that judges are supposed to screen out the junk first uh, so this particular issue, the judges are allowing things in that shouldn't be allowed in and saying it should go to weight. That's been recognized in other fields as well. And so it's not just psychological assessment evidence where that's happening. Um, and the, the reason the rule changed was to try and address that problem, to get judges to screen instead of having things go to weight. Um, so we, if we have time, we'll talk about that. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit more in the time I have left. Um, just kind of stepping back and talking about some other relevant projects and information. Um, this is one that Christopher King and I have been working on for a little bit, uh, where we basically took an estimation challenge to the same question. So we were looking across the entire history of case law in this project, um, and we found a sharp increase in psychological assessment evidence, expert evidence in recent years. I'll show you a graph of that shortly. Um, and, and then we basically replicate the finding that challenges are rare. So across the entire history of time that this type of evidence has come into American courts, the across 28,824 cases uh, where judicial opinions are citing psychological tests, uh, only about 1.66% of those have any kind of, um, we're estimating here based on the method for this project. Um, but basically uh, it's raising some questions about whether whether courts are keeping up with what we as psychologists are trying to bring in as evidence. So I mentioned that this type of evidence has steeply increased and you can see here um, that in the, um, so the, the, the entire uh, allness of the bar is how many cases we're bringing in that, that we found uh, bringing in psychological assessment evidence. Again, looking for, this is that whole body of 364 tools. Uh, so we see that it's coming in a lot more over from the 80s. There was some coming in, 90s, some coming in, 2000s, it jumps a lot, 2010s, even more. Um, and then the top of the bar, there's like a little line, and that's, it's not well demarcated. We need different colors. Um, but that's where it looks like there's a potential challenge. So it's just barely being challenged. And it's certainly, the challenges are not keeping pace with how commonly this type of evidence is coming into court. Maybe it shouldn't be, right? Like I'm not... There's no um, assumption here that there should be more challenges, uh, but based on what we saw in the previous results that we know that there is variation in quality of what psychologists are offering, uh, perhaps there should be, um, we should see more evidence of challenge. And then just um, the types of cases where psychological evidence is coming in, mostly it's coming in in civil cases, obviously plenty of uh, criminal and family as well, but now you can see that um, potential challenges look like they're happening more often in civil cases and family cases, uh, in criminal and family cases than in civil. Okay, so stepping back a little bit, doing a little discussion. I still have some slides um, that I'm, I'm gonna keep going. I have 10 more minutes. I'm gonna go for 10 more minutes. Thank you. Yeah. So overall, the good news is that we as a field have some great tests. We have some very psychometrically strong tests um, that have been developed and we know are in use in forensic practice. They're the most commonly used tools that we, um, we use as a field. That's good news. But alongside that good news, we also know that there are clinicians who are using psychometrically problematic tests in forensic practice. Um, sometimes maybe there's an argument for that, but there's little policing in the sense that like nobody is enforcing the ideal that we should be using strong, um, strong psychological assessment tests. Um, so we are internally not doing a great job of policing that as a field. 
and externally, the admissibility rules that the court has in place is not doing a great job of policing what we are doing. Overall, we find few legal challenges to the admit, uh, admit, admission of psychological assessment evidence. Courts don't appear to be very calibrated to it, uh, to our evidence. And when attorneys do raise challenges to our evidence, judges tend not to do a great job of subjecting it to the legal scrutiny required by law. Gatekeeping is difficult. This is a whole other um, problem. Uh, so we could think about, is this just a problem that we are facing in the US? Uh, most common law countries have seen an introduction of more stringent evidence reliability standards in recent decades. So we, in the 1990s, um, we had that sort of Daubert trilogy and then uh, it was codified in other types of, of law. I, I didn't mention this earlier, but that 1923 case, that was the first one before that. There was not really uh, an evidence admissibility standard, and that came from the lie detector test, um, which has all kinds of interesting history on its own. Anyway. Um, this question of whether it's just a U.S. problem. No, it's not just a U.S. problem. Um, so we, in the 1990s, tried to put legal rules in place that would address this problem. Canada closely followed our approach. The Law Commission of England and Wales um, adopted a, a similar set of reforms, but Australia did not. And so interestingly, they're also a common law country, but their um, sort of brain trust of attorney scholars took a look at what we were asking our judges to do, and they basically said it's not going to work. That is not going to work. It's going to be resource intensive and it's going to fail. So Australia said we're not doing that. Uh, so given that, so they they still have the relevance question, but they don't have a reliability question. So they still, like we do, the first question is, can this expert testify because their evidence is relevant to the case? That's still a rule in place both here and in Australia. But then they don't have the secondary reliability questions. Those or criteria, they don't have anything like that. Um, and so that offers a an, an ripe opportunity for a comparative analysis. So given that our courts in Australia, our, our, our courts in the US um, and our judges are operating with substantially different rules than Australian judges are to govern the admissibility of expert evidence, um, is, is there a difference in what's coming into court? Um, we, so I went, I had a, a really nice Fulbright um, opportunity while I was on sabbatical, um, got to go over to Australia for five months with my family, which was a highlight of a lifetime, um, and do this um, kind of comparative project. So and through the lens of psychological assessment um, evidence in courts. So a gist of what we have found so far, we mostly found that the psychological assessment tools that are used by our experts, our psychologists in the US and Australian psychologists are quite similar. Um, there are a handful of uniquely Australian tests that were developed in Australia and are used in Australia, um, and we're we're still sort of digging into some of that background. But big picture, we're we're a field of psychologists, and we're doing similar work with similar types of referral questions using similar types of approaches. Um, and the findings so far on the the question of whether the law is doing a better job, it doesn't look like it's doing any better or any worse. So it looks like. Um, there are different patterns, there are different things happening, but big picture, um, even though there are substantially different rules that the judges are following, there's, there's similar end, um, end result problems and challenges that are facing both systems. So then we can turn again to think about um, what can be done. There's lots of things that can be done, uh, which we do not have time to talk about here. Um, but I do want to highlight, I have mentioned this a few times, one of the things that can be done is that we can change the rules. We could change the rules of evidence that guide how judges are supposed to gatekeep what we have to offer. And it just has been changed. Um, so this is the kind of history of how that all came to be. 2017, there was this committee on 702 revision appointed after this symposium at a law school. All kinds of official processes that uh, happened. And then those changes just took effect um, on December 1st. So what changed? 702 is the federal rule of evidence, 702. That is the language that is basically, it guides the admissibility of expert evidence in federal cases, but most states have a version of what is FRE 702 for the individual states. And <clears throat> it is conceptually very similar to the Daubert um, criteria. So this is what changed. 
this is 702. This is the language you can you can see um, where I was saying there has to be it has to be relevant and then it has to be reliable. Um, some of that language about uh, the reliability pieces that we coded come later, but this piece uh, that's underlined, if the proponent demonstrates to the court that it is more likely than not that blah, 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 that is what's new. And that is a new legal um, test that has been added here that is in legal language signaling to courts and to judges that it here's the 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 standard is more likely than not that's a preponderance of the evidence so they're supposed to do their screening and miscibility determination um, based on a preponderance of the evidence so whether it is going to make it more likely that they actually do the admissibility ruling versus punting to jurors to have to deal with it through a weight type of analysis I don't know. That's a good empirical question, um, but this is the attempt that the most uh, most recent revision trying to solve the problem um, of how how this is happening in courts. In the one minute, one and a half minutes, two minutes I have left. The other thing we can do is us as a field, we can do better internal kind of gatekeeping. Um, so as psychologists, we can help solve the problem. One. Um, effort in this direction is a special issue that we we published last year in the Journal of Personality Assessment. Um, they're not all personality papers, many of them are, but they're all forensic papers. So the whole idea for this special issue was to um, pull together teams of authors to write on particular psychological assessment tools that we know are in use in courts and to pull good, up-to-date, credible information about their pros and their cons, their psychometric functioning, um, and, and so forth. And the audience for this is obviously us as psychologists, but also judges and attorneys to aid in the court's better approach to an understanding common types of evidence that psychologists bring into court. Um, the, the entire special issue is free. So the publisher, Taylor and Francis, worked with us. We wanted to make sure that this would not be behind a paywall, given that we're trying to make it um, be used in the real world. Um, so every one of these articles, there's 11 papers and uh, an edit sort of editorial piece at the beginning, all of that's free. Um, also, several of the teams are adversarial collaborations. So for example, on the Rorschach paper, we know, we know that there are a lot of psychologists still using Rorschach in forensic context, despite the fact that there's strong papers out there and critics saying it does not belong in forensic context. So we pulled together some of those people to write scholars um, and practitioners on both sides of that argument to write together to clarify where are the areas of agreement, where are the areas of disagreement, and how are the courts supposed to understand whether the Rorschach is appropriate for use in court if psychologists are not even on the same page. Um, so I'm out of time, but there's a Rorschach paper, there's an MMPA, uh, PI paper, a PAI, PAIA, MCMI4, and MC, MACI2, Trauma Symptom Inventory, Psychopathy Checklist Revised, SIRS 2, HCR 20, V3, the MCAT CA and the EXTER, uh, the CAST MR. Summary of all those um, papers is that every single one of those tools has both strengths and weaknesses. Tools are rarely challenged. Several of the papers looked for whether those tools had been challenged. And each paper also is trying to give attorneys, we had a sort of outline where we asked authors to give attorneys advice for how to challenge that type of tool. Um, and each paper points out gaps in the, in the research literature. Last thing I'm gonna mention, there's one more project that we published um, last year where we're thinking about how to improve the quality of forensic assessment, uh, forensic reports. Um, I did a webinar for this group last year on this. That should be available on the UN website, but also the paper is free. Um, there are eight considerations. There's a bunch of questions that go along with it. And that end questions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tess, Dr. Neal. Um, and I, the, the timing is impeccable in terms of the federal rules of evidence there. Um, I still always hope that when you talk about the general acceptance stats that they'll somehow miraculously change, but uh, I still I still cringe all the same. Um, we have we have tons of questions here. Uh, if you have any more questions for Dr. Neal, feel free to enter them in the Q and A box. Make sure that if you're doing the uh, or CE credits, make sure you click the link. Make sure that it works for you. Uh, 
several people have asked different questions to clarify what kinds of challenges or cases were included or not in some of these analysis. So I might throw a couple of those at you right now. Um, somebody said um, the study of challenges were clarifying if they were based on published cases. And if so, it, any idea if the patterns would be the same if for cases that are not published? It's a great question. And it's the biggest limitation of that paper. Um, and we don't, unfortunately, because because of the nature of appeals and the way we looked at that case and the way we could pull the data together to try and cobble together an answer. Um, that is the best way we could figure out how to approximate the answer. But of course, there's lots of cases where there are admissibility hearings where there is no, well, I guess it wasn't all appeals. It, many of the cases we were reading were appeals. Some of them were other kinds of documents where you know judges would write up a summary of something, briefs or whatnot. Uh, not briefs. Um, I can't even think of what they're called. There are briefs, but after an admiss admissibility hearing, sometimes judges write things up as well. But most of what we read were appeals, where there was some, you know, the the there was some issue of the admissibility process happening that's coming up in appeal, and that's obviously not the best way to answer the big question. I don't know what a better way is, uh, but if people have ideas, I would. I, 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 in a different approach to try and answer the same kind of question. I had a master's student who did her thesis um, on surveying clinicians, surveying our population of folks about whether we, whether you have ever been subjected to or experienced a challenge and more information about what happened in that context. We also surveyed attorneys and judges about whether they had attorneys, about whether they had ever raised a challenge to psychological assessment evidence um, and, and whether they've seen their colleagues to do it, do it, and judges, whether they had ever um, seen admissibility challenges to or seen attorneys raise challenges to um, psychological assessment evidence and what they did with those cases. We also had an experimental piece to that to see if they're able to recognize differences. Um, and the broad summary of that project is the judges and attorneys were clearly able to distinguish the worse from the better psychological assessment tools based on the psychometric properties. So in that case, in that study, it was not a question of ability, um, but it was in the real world, we know it's not always happening. So there's some disconnect between um, either in our method, which I think is part of the explanation, or in there's lots of other realities in the world. Attorneys might raise a challenge for strategic questions, that, strategic reasons that are not necessarily tied to the quality of the evidence and vice versa. They might not raise a challenge for strategic reasons when they arguably should be raising a challenge. So there's all kinds of, all kinds of things we could we we can continue to study and understand. Quite a quite a web to untangle. Somebody and somebody in the box noted that recently it came out that in New York State highlighted that very few percentage of uh, judges' rulings are actually published. Um, so you know all the all the complication of getting at this area through yep. experiments, surveys, all that around that. Um, somebody asked, given the adversarial context here, uh, if you knew of any investigation into if the assessment evidence being challenged, being presented by the defense or challenge presented by the prosecution, um, and if the success of challenges is linked to who is attempting to admit the evidence. If there's like a particular side here, there, there's a little bit more of a skew. I cannot remember if we tried to code for that. If we tried to code for that, then we must not have found anything notable. If we didn't code for that, that's a great question. I have immediate thoughts and hypotheses, but I don't I don't think I have any answers. So that's a great question. Fair enough. Um, someone asked if you could repeat the name of the journal that the special issue is, is in. The Journal of Psychological Assessment. Um, and I'm happy to send I'm happy to send you a link if you email me. Um, Tess Neal at iastate.edu. That answers several of the questions here. Asked people wondering if they could reach out to you. With yeah, any absolutely. There. Yes. Um, someone asked about uh, when it comes to fry jurisdictions. Uh, what are your thoughts on, about the relevant scientific community? Who belongs to that? Is it a case by case determination? That's another good question. I guess you could argue, if you were an attorney, you could argue different arguments. You know, depending on sort of strategically what made most sense for the argument you wanted to make. At the broadest level, if you're a psychologist, if you're clinically trained or trained in 
counseling psychology, then you're broadly in the community of people who are trained in the same sort of way to be able to recognize quality and psychological assessment evidence. But obviously many clinicians don't do anything with forensic cases. So maybe then if we're talking about forensic, forensically trained psychologists, that's a much smaller community of people, but it's still 7% of licensed psychologists. So it's still a sizable chunk of us, but then you could get really, um, you could get really narrow. So, right. Like depending on if you're a person who does child custody cases, I have no, I would not be a good peer to, I mean, I, I guess it depends again on what we're talking about. If, if you're, if you're thinking about um, a community who can evaluate the quality of a tool, you don't necessarily have to be trained in developmental psychology and family functioning to be able to evaluate whether a particular tool that a clinician who does practice in those cases, like the psychometrics of that tool. Um, so I think I think the answer to that could be a different answer, um, and I think it could be argued in lots of ways. It's a good question. Well, we do in fact have a question from a child custody evaluator who says that they find that a lot of folks in their field do use garbage tests and that these tests have been debunked numerous times. Their question is how do we get folks to move on past tests that they are comfortable with? One way is to consult your colleagues, right? So if you think that there's, if you know that there are people using not great tools, maybe you could offer, I mean, maybe that's not going to be perceived so well, but maybe you could say in a friendly way, like, hey, this particular tool, and there are some in child custody that are not great, that are scientifically problematic. That is one area where there is kind of a concentration of things that are used that are not great. Um, so you could sort of kindly and with um, good faith offer to help your colleagues uh, understand that some of the tools that they're using are problematic. And if they were to be effectively challenged, that it's going to just be a waste of time, um, or it could be. And what is the replacement? So if the, what, what are the reasons that they're using tools that are junky? And is there a good replacement? And how hard is it to learn that replacement? Um, so that's one path. Um, another is to consult with attorneys who are working in those cases to use the system and the admissibility rules to help attorneys effectively challenge. You can do a um, you can you can serve as a consultant to the attorney on challenging the other assessment, uh, the other the psychology, psychologists' um, evidence that they're trying to bring it to court. That's a legitimate role. It's a much more adversarial and um, sharp role to take than consulting friendly with fr in a friendly manner with a colleague, but it's potentially a more effective, depending on how it's perceived, on the on the more friendly front. Uh, there are probably other ways, but those are two ways I can think of. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and and last question here as we wrap up. Um, I mean, a lot of this is about acceptance of these instruments broadly and for particular forensic questions. Somebody asked, are judges considering the importance of culturally adaptive assessments in this process? Are they are they even aware of the you know cultural considerations of a test being specifically applied to an individual? Yeah, great question. And yes, actually, that is one of the one of the more effective um, pathways for challenge. So we we saw on that one case some of the fit, uh, some of the cases where there is a challenge, it's related to fit. A lot of those were this issue, um, and then also some of the validity cases were this issue of whether it was valid for the particular um, case on cultural grounds, uh, and also some of the. Um, kind of fundamental case law that's happened with regard to some of these questions of admissibility of psychological assessment evidence are on this issue of um, cultural validity. And some of them are coming out of Australia, some of them are coming out of Canada, more so actually than the US, but for, for certain that is happening, but not enough. Not enough, not even close. Well, uh, well thank you so much, Dr. Neil Tess for sharing all of this information, sharing all the work that you do and, and contributing all the work that you do uh, in this area. It's much, much appreciated. And tell from all the unanswered questions here, unfortunately, uh, a, a lot of engagement here and people thinking about um, how they can do better uh, and we as a field can do better.
Uh, that wraps up this week's Law and Mental Health series. Uh, we hope to see you next week when Dr. Lucy Guanera will cover uh, issues relevant to trauma and risk for false confessions. Until then, we have, hope you have a fantastic rest of the week and take care.